Thank you all again. Um, I imagine that like yours, mine, your heads are sort of spinning after this day of extraordinary people, but we've certainly saved the most head spinning 40 minutes until the end. Um, I am really thrilled and so delighted to welcome Catelyn onto the stage. She's come straight, almost straight from Toronto where she's been collecting a prize for the film version of her book, How to Build a Girl. Um, I think that's us, gentlemen. She doesn't need any introduction, of course. She's award-winning, I think, in everything. A co columnist for the Times. Um, and she's won four six times. times. Six times you won the Columnist for the Year. I won fourth Columnist twice for, uh, for Interviewer, yes. Yeah, we can, we can clap all, yes. all the ones. I can list she's, them all. She's the best-selling author of a number of books, How to Build a Girl, as I've said, um, How to Be a Woman, her own anthologies of her works, and also her latest fantastic book, which is How to Be Famous. I'm sure many of you have read it. I've actually seen people already reading it all through the day outside. Um, I think certainly through her incredibly gloriously honest writing and wit, she changes lives almost every day, her readers. Some men, I think, but many young women and many women in particular. And I'm going to use the words of um, another extraordinary writer and journalist, Marina Hyde, who many of you I'm sure will know, who tweeted this, this week, having come to the book a little bit late, is there a greater swashbuckler abroad on the high seas than at Catelyn Moran? Assuredly not. And she's talking about how to be famous. Her latest book is so wonderful, even better than the amazing How to Build a Girl, packed with all her divine characters and hilarious riffs and crackpot genius theories, all of which I'm fully on board with. I truly believe Catelyn changes the world for teenage girls and obviously 45-year-old ones like me too. And I think she, she certainly does. If you're not on Twitter, I'm slightly envious of you for not being on Twitter, but you should go on just to read Catelyn's tweets every day, which are a thing of joy. Yeah, they, they kind of peak after about six o'clock in the evening, so that's when I start <laughs> drinking, so that's when it gets a little bit loosey-goosey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just don't read any of her stuff, I think, in public places is mainly the, is mainly the lesson. So thank you very, very much indeed. No, for it's my pleasure to be us. here. And, and thank you all. I'm, I'm aware that you're about to take life advice from someone who's wearing Crocs. And uh, <laughs> I congratulate you all for being open-minded enough to accept that. That's good. That will stand you in good stead. I took the dog for a walk. And the thing is, if you've got teenage girls, you buy all these clothes and these shoes, and then they just mysteriously disappear. Uh, so I was going to wear some different shoes, and then I found out they were on my daughter's feet, and she's 20 miles away. So yes, it's Crocs today. <laughs> Which I would say is the best shoe. If you've got a dog and you take a dog for a walk, when it needs a drink, you can just pour water into your crock and it can drink from it like a lovely bowl. So I'm all for multi... And you can also pop them in the dishwasher if they need a wash. Uh, people tend to be upset when they see them coming back out of a dishwasher that has plates in that they've eaten from, but I've put my moon cup in the dishwasher before now and it's a sterilising machine. I'm just using it for what it was built for. So we're talking a little bit today about changing lives. Um, you grew up in Wolverhampton. Yes. Eight, one of eight? Yes, one of eight, the eldest of eight, yes, so in charge of them very much. Did you always, did, were you always thinking how you, that you wanted to change your life? You, obviously, your life changed massively when you were about 15, I think. And then yes. Suddenly, were you always ambitious, always dreaming of changing your life? Yeah, I, well, my father um, had been in a band that was successful for about six weeks. Um, successful in the way that he managed to sell some drugs to both David Bowie and Jimi Hendrix. That was kind of the height of his, uh, his fame and success. Um, and then he spent the rest of his life trying to become famous again, so he would just keep buying musical equipment. And he'd written six songs in 1970. Um, that he would then re-record every three years in the most popular musical genre of the time. So we had uh, punk versions of these songs, uh, easy listening versions of these songs, we had rave versions of these songs. And by the time I got to the age of 13, I realised he probably wasn't going to make it. It was, uh, it was very clear the world wasn't really needing a 45-year-old jazz drummer uh, to save the world. When we watched Live Aid, he was sitting there going, next time they do Live Aid, I'll be on that stage. And I remember thinking very clearly, no, you won't. You will not be a member of the Live Aid lineup next time it happens. Um, so at the age of 13, I decided that I needed to take my fate into my own hands. And luckily, because I, we were home educated, our parents took us out of school when I was 10, and so we spent all our time in the library. And thankfully, there were just a million books that told me what to do if I was a slightly weird working class girl. I had Joe March, um, I had Avenue of Green Gables, I had Jane Eyre, um, I had nearly all of E. Nesbitt's characters, Mother and the Whaleboat Children. And what they all do is write. Uh, you know, when things get difficult, they write. That's, that's the thing you can do if you're poor. Um, before then, I'd wanted to be either a dancer or an actor, um, but you need to have friends and facilities to do these things and also talent and I had none of those things. Um, 
but I was chatty, um, and I'd seen a lot of musicals where girls, again, can struggle against the odds and make it. And I was really lucky that I didn't read any books by men or watch any films that were written by men with female characters in generally. I didn't realise until I was in my 30s and I started reading the canon of sort of great white male authors that when men write characters, female characters, they just get them wrong. If I'd been brought upon those characters, like they'll describe women coming into the room. There's one where he describes a woman coming into the room and how her breasts leap up to meet him gratefully. Breast has never done that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether he was confusing it with penises, which can move around a lot. But these are—it's a very different mechanism. They are the girls just stay where they are at all times. They're never—they're not very mobile. Um, I can remember reading uh, the first Ian Fleming book where he was describing a woman. Again, it's quite breast. The men tend to really describe breasts quite a lot. Um, he described a woman as having breasts with uh, nipples uh, like hazelnuts. Um, first of all, first of all, that was distressing anyway. Secondly, I was confused and thought that he meant Brazil nuts, and I was like, what? Um, and thirdly, it meant eating ski hazelnut yogurts was ruined for me for the rest of my life after that. Um, I just presumed they were bosom flavour. Um, so luckily, I only read, read female characters written by women, and so I never felt weird, because women write about weird girls like themselves, and I was like, oh, well, I'm perfectly normal then. Had I been out in a male world, I think I would have thought that I was weird, because I was. Um, I was a very fat, mono-browed, round-faced, optimistic girl who just wanted to be noble and good at all times. Um, and men tend to not write about those girls. They just write about the sexy, dangerous girls. Um, and I didn't want to ever be a sexy, dangerous girl. I wanted to be useful. Um, uh, and I think that's a very... With my writing, I think there are two kinds of fame. And there are, first of all, the people who become famous, and they just want to be on a stage and basically wave at people and be like, hey, I'm here. And they'll show off and they'll play their songs or tell their jokes or do their acting or whatever. And they just want to show off and entertain you. And that's great. You know, I love those. I love being entertained. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm more interested in the second kind of fame, which is people who want to be useful, who want to do a thing. I think if you have a public platform, you have the opportunity to clear a space and set a tone and invite people into this space and go, this is what we're going to talk about. So the space I, I clear and the tone I like to set is, here we're going to be truthful. Here we're going to talk about things that people don't usually talk about. Everyone is welcome. The tone is polite. The only rule is don't be a dick. Um, and we're going to try and talk about things that, that no one's spoken about before. And the thing that makes me most happy is when women come up to me and go, you put into words what I've always felt but I didn't know that I could express, or you have described something that I have never seen described before, and that is absolutely part of my life. For instance, I am now 44, um, I have two children, which is by way of saying that my vagina has seen a lot of action over the years. Um, it's, uh, it's been a useful and brave old noble horse. And uh, I noticed that when I got into a bath, I would have a bath, I would wash, I would get out, I would dry, I would dress, I would walk downstairs, and then suddenly some water would come out that would smell of Radox or Badidas. And I was like, well, I've never heard that described before. Like, kind of, is it just me? Like, kind of... And the first time I spoke about it on stage in front of 2,000 people, there was a silence for 30 seconds, and then everyone started laughing. And I was like, okay, that's not just me. That is happening to other people. That's... And that's your job, I think, as a writer, is to talk about the things that no one else has spoken about before. I mean, you say, you say that in, in How To Be Famous. I'm sure there are secret messages in all books if you look hard enough. Generations of girls trying to tell other girls' secrets without getting found out. Yes. What are the secrets that you're trying to tell through How To Be Famous? Oh, well, I was inspired to write about that. I, I read um, Moby Dick for the first time. Uh, just after reading the complete works of Oscar Wilde. And both of those, it was very obvious to me, they're both gay authors in a time where you just couldn't be open about your homosexuality. And they just seemed to be trying to write in a codified way about how they felt and what they were like in a time where you had to, you had to codify it a bit, but if you were gay yourself or gay sympathetic, you would instantly go, I know what you're saying here. I know what, you, I know what you're saying when you describe people. I know what you're saying when you describe your life. So in How To Be Famous, there were two things that I wanted to do in it. First of all, I wanted to talk about sex. I have two teenage girls. And, uh, and I know the statistics now that young people generally learn about sex from online pornography. And from a very early age, I told my girls, like, at some point you'll be shown this by someone on a phone or you'll look for it yourself. And you have to remember that what you're seeing there, that's not people having sex. Pornography is not sex. That's why it's called pornography. It has a different word. And that's two people at work. That's, like, that's, 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 that's their job and their career. They're not having sex. They are at work that day. They're clocking on and they're clocking off or clocking on and clocking off. Um, <laughs> 
and that's not what sex is like. And um, a friend of mine who's a feminist campaigner did a, speak, uh, did a talk in a school and then had a mother come up to her afterwards, very distressed, saying, my boy came home yesterday, he's 16, and he was crying, and I finally got him to tell me what had happened, and he had tried to have sex for the first time with his 16-year-old girlfriend, and he had started to strangle her, and she had started to cry and went, I don't like it, and he started to cry and went, I don't like it either, but I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And this is a terrible situation we have got ourselves into as a species and a culture, that this is what young people, what a horrible thing for boys and girls to think that that is what sex is like. And how have we managed to screw up having sex? Like, animals do it. Cats do it on the shed roof outside my house every day, and they are not <laughs> accidentally strangling each other and, and not enjoying the experience. Um, so I wanted to write truthfully about sex and to step you through what it's like, all the different kinds of sex, what it's like to have sex with a friend, what it's like to have sex with a bad man, so you can recognise that, what it's like to have incredible sex, um, and, and step you through it in the same way. I was inspired by when I gave birth to my second daughter, I got one of those hypnobirthing tapes, and it talks you through what it's like to give birth. And I was just thinking, well, I've never been taught through what it should be like to have sex. I've never had that described to me, and that's a really useful thing. And like, you know, the kind of girl that I was, I looked for my information in books, that's where I'll put the information. These girls can pick up this book and actually know what it's like to have sex, to know that that's a wrong thing, that you don't need to do that. You can say what you like, that you should be able to know what you like. Because if you don't know what you like sexually, then sex is something that's going to happen at you and on you, quietly. And there's also there's a sort of one of the themes in the book, she has sex with a bad man. And I only realised when I was much older that I had always presumed I was brought up in an age where if you went into a room with a man, kind of anything could happen in there. Like, kind of, like, that's, you know, once you go into a room with a man, it, that's, it's kind of on you, you went in there. Like, anything can happen, bad things can happen, good things can happen, but that's just you going into that room and doing that thing, you kind of have to go along with it. You've bought your ticket for the ride, and that's not how it should be. You've got to be talking to each other all the time. So I wanted to write about a bad sexual experience and show what the consequences of that are and, and how you can learn to overcome sexual shame. Because for women, sexual shame is something that you are given. You do something, and then you are given shame for having done it. You are talked about for having done a bad thing. Your, your reputation is ruined. People are gossiping about you behind your back. But the shame has been given to you. And you are not the one that should be having the shame. You need to give the shame back to the person who gave it to you and go, no, the shame is yours. You did the bad thing. I did nothing at all that was wrong or bad. I went in there willingly and cheerfully to try and be, have a good time. You take the shame back. And the way that Johanna finds to uh, give the shame back to the person who has made this sex tape about her and shamed her and ruined her reputation is she screens it on stage in, in a, at a gig and she narrates it and she explains what's happening there. Everyone's been gossiping about it. Everyone has presumed that they knew what she was thinking or why she was doing it. And she goes, no, I'm going to tell this story now. I am going to narrate what you think is my sexual shame and give that shame back to the person who gave it to me. And as I was writing the book, it was when the Me Too movement kicked off. And so as I was writing it in real time, women all over the world had done exactly what my character was doing. They were going, no, I give you back the sexual shame. It is yours. You did the bad thing. I was going to say, obviously, you know, the book is about shame. You say it, the idea that women carry shame for shameful things is Bible old. Yes. And Bible, Bible black. black. Yes. Um, and, and that, you know, this idea that women should just absorb unpleasantness that men dole out to us. So when you look around and you see Me Too and women are you know, not necessarily screening their shame for yes. everyone, but talking about it and voicing it. Do you think, yes, Absolutely. we're on our way? Well, this, this is the amazing thing about social media. We know all the bad things about being a woman on social media, all the rape and death threats. It's very difficult. Half the women I know who are on Twitter have left um, because they, you know, they just can't handle that kind of stress anymore. I refuse to go. I'm like, no, I'm going to stay there. Yes, please don't go. I'm going to keep being lovely and keep being nice and keep retweeting great things and kind of like, you know, and being like a conduit and a platform and giving people my platform and sharing it. It's a useful space and I set a tone. Um, but this is one of the great things, because one of the questions I've got asked over and over again in the last 10 years since I started writing about feminism is, what about the men? Uh, I would, whatever Q&A I would do, there would always be someone at the end who would go, yeah, you've said all this about women, but what about the men? What do we do about boys? What do we do about men? And for the first eight years, I was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just do women. I'm, I'm team tits. Like, kind of, that's, that's my wheelhouse. That's my speciality. Like, kind of, I'm sorting out the women. I can't now sort out the men as well. It would be the ultimate irony of feminism if having sorted out the women, women then had to sort out men as well. Like, no. <laughs> no, go away. Sort yourselves out. Um, but then I've recently realised that is not correct. The, uh, the definition of feminism is the belief in social, political and economic equality between the sexes. And there are ways that men are unequal in the way that women are unequal. So I went on Twitter a couple of months ago and said, I'm always talking about what's difficult for men. 
uh, for women, what's difficult for men? And my Twitter feed went mental for like, it was like two or three weeks, thousands and thousands of replies. It got picked up as a news story all around the world. And the replies ranged from really funny to absolutely heartbreaking. So the funny ones, there was a guy who said, um, if my wife wants to dress sexy for me, she's got these beautiful things she can wear, like beautiful basques and stockings, and like she'll look beautiful and she'll look powerful and she'll feel confident, and that's amazing for me and that's great. If I want to dress sexy for my wife, and I go to Anne Summers, the only option I have is like an elephant-shaped posing pouch. <laughs> and initially I was like, wow, that's quite funny. <laughs> or pants with like beast written on them. And then I was like, but then that's... And again, ha, 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 ha. But I was like, but if women, if that was the only thing that we had, things that either said that our genitals were dangerous and threatening or they're amusing, we'd be furious. That's, that's an awful shaming thing for men to feel about themselves. Similarly, uh, men saying, then, then the sort of heartbreaking answers, one man going, um, no, so many men going, if I see a child who's hurt or lost in the playground, I don't feel I can go over and help that child because I will be seen as threatening. So I have to go and find a woman, find my wife, find someone else and tell them to go and look after that child. And again, it's such, it's such an innate thing in human beings to want to be helpful, to want to help people, to want to bring comfort, to want to stop a child crying or being hurt. And if we're telling half the population that they're, they're dangerous and they're seen as a threat, you know, for teenage boys, if you're like a 10-year-old boy, you know you could go and help a child because you're not seen as a threat. But you get to, what, 14, 15, you get to a certain height, your voice drops, and suddenly you're dangerous, innately dangerous and threatening to people. That's a terrible thing to bring, to bring boys and men up believing. So, so I sort of started thinking about what the differences were between men and women. And the difference, we're in living completely different timelines, men and women. So in the last 120 years, women's story has been extraordinary. In the last 120 years, we've gained the vote. We can have jobs, we can get educations, we can own property. Uh, you know, we have this power, we can talk about our sexuality, we have contraception. We've changed the way that we dress, we wear trousers, we can smoke cigarettes, we can cut our hair short in a bob and look like a flapper. All these incredible things, we're in space. In the same 120 years, nothing's really changed for men. Like it kind of, except we don't wear top hats anymore, um, unless you're slashed from Guns and Roses. But like, kind of like, nothing's really changed for men in the last 120 years. And the difference is feminism, the, this network, informal, crowdsourced network that we call feminism, which we have to remember has no Bible, has no Parliament, has no president, has no rules. It's something that people made up. It's an informal network of women giving each other advice, going, try this blog, read this book, try this thing, I give you this advice, these are the laws that you should look at, here's something we can change, here's how we campaign. We have this network of, of being able to support each other, and men do not have that network. The other reply that I kept getting was men going, I just feel lonely. And one man going, I was at university for three years feeling absolutely suicidal, and I would go to the pub every week with my friends, and we would just talk about sport. And I see my women friends, if something wrong happens to them, or my wife, all the girls come round, they're talking about these things, they're crying, they're explaining these things, they're talking about their childhoods, they come up with a plan, they solve things. And he was like, I'm jealous of that. And the difference is, in the last 120 years, is women have taken male things. We have taken the things that we see in men and that we coveted, the idea that we can be educated, the idea that we can have jobs, the idea we can be in space and wear trousers and smoke cigarettes. Men have not taken the female things, the idea of community and emotional honesty and support systems and being able to change the way that you dress and transformation. And that's because female things are seen as lesser. There was no loss of status for women to go, I will take male things as well as my female things. But for men to take female attributes, they would be seen as lessening themselves. And the only way that we can change that is cultural. That's why every time we get something like Fleabag, we get a Phoebe Waller-Bridge, or we get a, a Lena Dunham, or we get a bridesmaid that makes a million pounds, a billion pounds at the box office, or we get a female leader, that is to the betterment of men and women. And it's the men that I really want to concentrate on, like kind of it, 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 that every female success will make it in the long term easier to be men, because the more we raise women's statuses, and the more women we look up to, and the more powerful women there are, the more successful and loved women there are, then the less, uh, the, the less that women's attributes will be seen as lesser. We will start thinking of women as equal and go, well, it's great to do these female things, that's fine. It's cool to do female things and male things. And that's what I see happening in culture. We're slowly rolling towards this thing. I would like it to be faster, but this is why I'm positive, because I see these changes happening. Already generationally, like my daughter's male friends will hug each other, they will talk to each other, their parents are divorcing, and they will sit and talk to each other honestly in a way that boys didn't in my generation. So. I mean, I was born an optimist, and that is my political creed above everything else, but I do, even though we often at the moment think the world is chaotic and awful and going backwards, it is politically, 
But culturally, what we're doing in the language we use, in the way that we communicate with each other, in the things that we're watching and spending our money on, and the words that we're using, things are getting better. Johanna says in the book, though, that if she speaks out um, about her shame, it will make, there'll just be two types of men, sad men and bad men. Yes. And but do you not think that, that has happened slightly f from Me Too? Yes, I notice that very much because I think when we talk about, so it's very often that we'll talk about men as a whole and rather than specifying bad men. And it's just as simple as that because the good men go, but why are you lumping me in with all of this? And then they feel defensive. You know, I understand that thing when, uh, you know, when you sort of see men going, uh, you know, it's easier to be a woman now, like kind of women are winning, feminism has gone too far. And when you see incels saying that just before they go and shoot 30 women in Canada, thus proving it's really not easier to be a woman because <laughs> they are being shot by incels. Um, but I do understand that that feeling that men have that kind of they're being left behind and that is because they don't have an equivalent of feminism they have no network to improve themselves the only uh, vaguely comparable thing is the men's rights uh, uh, movement and the problem with the men's rights movement which is all about kind of trying to make men feel their power um, is that those men are judging themselves against women they're always going, uh, they're presuming that power is a pie, and the more power that women have, the less power that men have, and that's not how it works. You know, women are doing something completely different. We're, we're expanding the total amount of power available. It's not at the expense of men. One of the things you just mentioned was Fleabag, and I think How to Be Famous, and lots of your work is very much about female friendship and mentorship. Yes. She would never do the bold things she does if she didn't have her great friend Suzanne. Suzanne, yeah, yeah. And is that something, again, that you feel quite passionate about, communicating the importance of female friendship? Because that is missing from a lot of literature and writing. Massively. And, I, and it took me... So, my, so I'm writing at the moment the sequel to uh, uh, How to Be a Woman. It's called More Than a Woman. Uh, and my friend Lauren Laverne suggested that the subtitle of it be Because It Gets So Much Fucking Worse. Um, so... <laughs> So I realised that How to Be a Woman was about creating yourself from your teenage years to your early 30s and you kind of work out who you are and kind of what you're going to wear and who you want to go out with and all this stuff. And then you're told that when you get into your 30s, it's all good, or you think it's going to all get easy. You know who you are. You're just going to parties and capture your wardrobe and everything will be sorted. And what actually happens is the lives of everybody around you explode when you get into middle age. That's when you have teenage children. That's when your friends get divorced. That's when businesses go down the pan. That's when parents get old. And suddenly you are a coping system for the world. And one of the chapters in this uh, was me confessing the biggest secret that I had until the age of 32, which was that I hated women. Um, uh, you know, up until the point where I wrote, wrote uh, How to Be a Woman, because I had... Uh, because when I was going out as a young teenage girl uh, in the music industry and then in my early 20s, the fun was with the men. Whenever I was at a dinner party, I'd always be kind of like, am I at the right end of the table or the wrong end of the table? The right end of the table was where the men were, because that was where it's funny, and they were talking about business, and they were all joking, blah, blah, blah. and the wrong end of the table, to me, seemed to be the women's end, where they'd all just be crying and going, oh, love, oh, babe, it'll be okay. <laughs> so I want to be talking about Xmas, I want to be talking about their mum, and I was like, oh, God, I don't want to be down the miserable end of the table, fuck this shit. I want to be where the fun is. <laughs> And then my life exploded and I found myself down at the wrong end of the table going, my life has exploded, everything's terrible. And that was where I found out the power of female friendship. Like, they are there when the shit hits the fan. That was when I learned the power of, of how women are. Um, and that was where I realised this whole idea that women aren't funny, uh, which I'd seen Christopher Hitchens and Martin Amis both saying, is completely incorrect. If you go to a pub and generally things are still split by gender and there's a table of men and a table of women having their great night out, if the men are saying something funny, they'll be like, oh, nice one, good bit. Oh, yeah, too right, nice, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Uh, women, on the other hand, are going, ah, oh, no, stop, 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 I'm going to pee myself, I'm going to pee myself, no, stop, 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 lying under a table, going, ah, oh, you've got to stop yourself. It's very obvious to me who's being funnier there, and... <laughs> And humour is made from darkness. Humour, the greatest jokes are the ones about unspeakable things and about dark things and about tragedy and sort of like claiming your awful experiences and retelling the story with yourself as a hero. And women have so much more material than men in that, in that respect. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I spoke to many of my female friends and they all said they'd gone through the same thing. And like most of the alpha female friends that I have now said they went through a period in their teens and 20s of just wanting to hang out with the boys, wanting to be the cool girl, because that was where all the power was. Um, and it's only as you get older you actually realise, no, God, the real power, the people who are getting things done, the people with the really dark secrets, the people you want on your side at the female end of the table. Talking about you and your teens, I know you say at the beginning of your books that it's not you. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. You'd have to... <laughs> that your publishers take you into a room and go, look, people could sue you, so say it's fiction. It's not. 
No, no. We, we might have guessed it's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that younger girl, um, it's, it's the slightly more heartbreaking elements of the book are the deep despair, I think you write, that she feels with her body image. And that's then. Yes. And looking now at how it is to be a young girl with social media, where then it's in a magazine, now it's everywhere. Do you think now is a quite alarming and, and worrying and almost the worst time to be a young girl? Well, again, I thought that two years ago, because I've got teenage girls and I saw them on Instagram and they sort of, like, one time my daughter came in and went, oh my God, I'm ugly, like, look at these girls. Like, and she'd be showing me these pictures and i go, yeah, but they're supermodels, babe. It's their job to be that beautiful. And she went, that's not, that's a girl in my class called Anna. <laughs> <laughs> And I looked at her, and I was intimidated. And I'm like, I'm on acquaintance terms with Richard Maidley. I'm quite powerful, but I was looking at this girl going, fucking hell, she's gorgeous. I don't know if I could be in the room with her. Um, so that was very much the case two years ago. But again, it's kind of like we sort of, we do teenage girls massive discredit to think that they are kind of overwhelmed by this and they just sit there passively accepting all this stuff. Because two years ago, it was all about perfection. But very quickly, people got bored of those accounts with perfection. And now the accounts that have got the rocketing circulations, the ones about body positivity, they're the ones where, you know, Jamila Jamil has been amazing with this, kind of like tweeting pictures of her stretch marks and kind of like, you know, her roles. And it's all just girls now of all different abilities and colors and sizes posting pictures of themselves going, I'm beautiful and everyone just going yeah you are babe like kind of again culturally these things solve themselves really quickly teenage girls are not passive they will sit there and go they, you know they'll sit and watch it for a certain amount of time and then they go no I want to change it and the great thing about social media is you can you are both audience and producer you know you make the content and there's always more girls who feel bad about their bodies and want to solve that and 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 then find a way to find their bodies beautiful than there are beautiful girls in the world beautiful girls are a tiny minority um, <laughs> You're very positive about social media. I mean, obviously, mm. you said you're an eternal optimist, but it, is a, it can be a very dark place. Twitter, you use brilliantly, but it can be a very dark and very distressing place. Oh, yeah. And then when you go through, there's like, at some point, I'm going to write, like, write a, like a survival manual to being on social media because it goes through waves. Like, yes. you go on there, and it's, it's kind of the plot to um, How to Build a Girl, which we just made into a film, that you, when I was a 16-year-old girl as a music journalist, and I, I started off and I was all positive and like, bands are great and life is great. And then all the boys at the magazine would slag me off and just go, you sound like an excitable teenage girl. And I'd be like, but I am an excitable teenage girl. But I learned the game very quickly was to slag bands off and to become cynical and to become dark, and that was how you got your power. And then I realized that that was not a good thing to do, and I became nice again. And the thing about being cynical is that you put on cynicism when you are young and you are innocent to protect yourself. Uh, you know, you become this sort of battling hard thing, and it's like a coat of armor. But the problem with putting on armor, the armor of cynicism, is that it constricts you. You can't grow you can't dance you can't be joyful when you're cynical you have to learn either the easy way or the hard way that the best and bravest thing to do is to go no here's beautiful things this is what I believe in and when I started being a teenage journalist no one else had a national platform to write about these things now Every teenager has it. That's social media. Everyone is a writer. Everybody's out there. And you go through that arc. You start off positive. Some people attack you. Then you become cynical and bitter. And then you have to go all the way out the other side of that and go, no, I'm going to revert to my core beliefs. I'm a lovely person, and I just want to point at nice things. And I think that's one of the greatest things you can do as a human being. Ignore the bad stuff. Point at great things. We don't need to tweet about Trump and Johnson. We know they're dicks. <laughs> tweet about Greta Thunberg. Tweet about Emma Gonzalez. Tweet about what's happening in your neighborhood. Tweet Tweet about the organisations that are happening there. Tweet in support of your local library. Tweet about your heroes. Tweet pictures of yourself looking beautiful and joyous. Tweet a picture of your dog. God knows we need it. I can't believe I was just about... <laughs> I feel mean now to do what I was just about to quote you about your tweet. I'm gonna, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. At times the speed, accumulation and sheer what the fuckness of events make it seem as if huge swathes of the government watched in the loop and the thick of it and saw them not as satires but training videos. Yes. <laughs> I how genuinely how think do we true. stay optimistic in the face of... Well, Based because all of that. it's very easy to become pessimistic at the moment because we are clearly in a period of destruction. You know, things are being torn apart. Um, but if you read enough history, you realise that it's cyclical. We go through a period of construction and we go through a period of deconstruction. Things are chaotic and destructive at the moment. But if you remember 10 years ago when we were talking about politics, I can remember me and the editor of Newsnight tweeting each other going, it's really boring at the moment, isn't it, politics? Everybody's converged in the centre. There's no characters. It's really dull. And, you know, and we all wanted things to change and people were apathetic about voting. Well, that's 
that's all changed. We are in a period of destruction. And even though awful things are happening now, there will come a point suddenly where everyone will go, fuck, we went too far. This has become too chaotic. This is too awful. And that's the point where you stand forward and go, I've got some ideas. Let's start building things again. Let's start doing things in a different way. We knew it wasn't a perfect system before. We don't want to go back, you know, to think, oh, if we went back to 10 years ago, it was also lovely. It wasn't. We all had our complaints. So this is a chance, once the destruction has finished, to step forward and go, okay, let's start again. Let's write a constitution. Let's talk about representation. Let's talk about moving parliament out of London. Let's talk about more regional power. Let's talk about getting more people of colour and more women in, involved in politics. Let's talk about local initiatives. Let's talk about social enterprises. Um, Can we so, persuade you to get involved in politics? Well, I foolishly, about six years ago, someone said, would you ever run in pol for politics? And uh, I said, I will if Boris Johnson becomes prime minister. <laughs> Because at the time, that wasn't going to happen. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty safe with that. So, yeah, now I'm having to eat my words. I am getting involved in politics. The next book is, because I don't think being a politician would be useful. I think I'm good at ideas and platforms and spaces and encouragement. So the next book is, I, I start my plan for, so the next book is uh, More Than a Woman, then the book after that is called How to Change the World. So I, I lay out the beginnings of my plan in the next book, and then the book after that is, is how we would do it. I'm quite excited about it. I can't reveal what they are, but I'm very excited about one of the ideas. Well, you will definitely have to come about how to change the world here because it's definitely the right, right vibe. Um, I'm, again, it's gone way far too quickly. There's so much more I wish that we could speak about, but the time's up. So thank you. Keep thank doing you what so. you're doing, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, guys. you thank all you. very much. <laughs>